the God who is never far. That's how we can proclaim infinite hope. That's how we're even here right now, the God who is near. Thank you so much. I don't know where you went. That beautiful, beautiful, beautiful music. Beautiful, beautiful. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Using Shane Claiborne's language, he calls these people holy troublemakers. Holy troublemakers. You know, I think at the very top of the list is Mr. Rogers. He was a holy troublemaker, and I cannot wait to speak to that guy in heaven. I was just talking with my wife about this right before coming up. He is a holy troublemaker. Okay, back to the text. I just got a little excited. I love Mr. Rogers. (laughs) So this is very interesting because this is the last beatitude listed here but it's not the end of the description of the persecution because it goes, Jesus goes into verses 11 and 12 as well. This is the only beatitude that has multiple verses prescribed to it. And if you're familiar with the Greek thought, you know that the alpha, the beginning, and the omega are critical. That's, that's the whole thing. You know, Jesus calls himself the alpha and the omega. So we really need to pay attention to what's going on here with persecution for righteousness' sake. I also want to highlight at the very beginning, the very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We hear the same language with those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The verses go on. Verse 11 and 12, Matthew 5. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hmm. You know, there's a certain level of anxiety that sometimes we self-create as Christians sometimes. Maybe you've said this, maybe you've heard this said, well, the church was incredibly persecuted in its early days. Maybe we're just not Christ-like enough. Maybe that's why we're not persecuted. Or maybe you've heard someone say, you know what, the church needs some good persecution. That'll wake us up. Friends, I I know that comes from a place of good faith. I I really genuinely believe that. But I don't believe that's the point of this text. My thesis for this short time together that we have is that this final beatitude is actually not about persecution. It's about focusing on Jesus. It's about focusing on Jesus. Eugene Peterson, you know, Pastor Michael and I love Eugene Peterson. He he translates it this way, Matthew 5.10. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Persecution is a natural result of the inward faith. It's not the other way around. Persecution will happen if you focus on Jesus and live the lifestyle that is ridiculous, such as peacemaking, such as being pure in heart, such as being merciful. This crazy, crazy list of beatitudes will get you in trouble because when the light enters, the darkness, the dark is not having it. The dark is not having it. So let's develop this a little bit. I want to skip ahead to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verses 24 and 25. Jesus says this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to him a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, here's where it gets crazy. And the rain descended. Did it say the rains may come? No, it says the rains descended. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But what happened to the house? It did not fall for it was founded on the rock. Persecution is the natural result of the Christian life, not the focus. The storm will come. Jesus promises that. But there is hope. This whole thing reminds me of my favorite story in all of Scripture. One of my favorites. I don't know. I I change each week. Whichever one I read most recently. (laughs) Matthew 14. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but you can go there if you want to follow along. This is the story of Peter walking on water. It's so ridiculous. Can we just acknowledge that a lot of the stories in the Bible are ridiculous? And amen to that, because real life is also quite ridiculous. So, as you may know the story, 
Jesus was just dealing with a lot of bad news. He had heard about John the Baptist, his friend being killed, and he was dealing with that. He was spending time with God. He had just had a really long day, so he's, he's doing the thing he does where he spends time with his father. So the disciples are out fishing while Jesus is doing this, and those of you who are actual fishermen, I'm just a pretend fisherman. I caught one fish at summer camp. You can tell me whether or not this is true. I think fishing in the middle of the night, you're more likely to catch a fish. Do I, have a, do I have a witness out there? Is that true? Oh, mercy. Yes, I saw one hand. Amen. Okay, so cool. We can fact check uh, me later, but I believe you. So uh, they're out fishing in the middle of the night. The Bible says that this was really, really early in the morning. It's about 4 a.m., somewhere like that. So they're fishing, they're doing their thing, and then all of a sudden, off in the distance, they see this guy that looks like he's walking on water. Now, the disciples are very composed, right? They'd be like, hmm, yes, faith will protect me. Everything is fine right now. No, they were losing their minds. They're like, guys, that's a ghost out there. What is going on? This ship is sinking. There's a storm. I don't know, like, what, what is happening? And in the midst of that chaos, Jesus says, fear not. It is I. So Peter, being the level-headed person he is, says, if it's you, God, then tell me to walk on water. And I imagine Jesus kind of chuckling to himself like, okay, Peter, come on. Let's go. So Peter gets out and he starts walking on the water. And this is not something that normally happens. Can we just acknowledge people don't normally walk on water? So he's out there. And I imagine the other disciples are like, is he, is that actually happening? And I imagine their minds are blown. All this is happening. Peter's walking to Jesus. And while he's looking at Jesus, he's able to do this thing that shouldn't happen. He's able to walk on the water. But wouldn't you know it? The storm came, the winds came. There were things going on around him that forced him. He chose to look away from Jesus. He looked at the storm, he looked at the water. I imagine he looked at that giant fish that was below there. I don't know what's the biggest fish in Galilee, but I imagine that was right below his feet. And he noticed that. And he began to sink because his focus, his gaze was not on Jesus. It was on the things that were surrounding him that were his persecution, the things that were louder than Jesus' voice. So he began to sink, and he's falling. And I imagine with lungs full of water, he cried, Lord, save me. I couldn't do an impression with lungs full of water, so that's the best I got. Lord, save me. And immediately, what happened? Immediately, Jesus stretched his hand into the water. So we have access to that same prayer. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying to you? I don't know what storm you're going through. I don't know what nonsense is happening in your life. Like, like our hosts were saying, maybe no one knows what you're going through. But you can have that same prayer that Peter did. And Jesus will immediately reach his hand into your situation. There's a painting, I believe we have a picture of it, that is just one of my absolute favorite paintings. Um, it's by a man named Yong Sung Kim, and it's called The Hand of God. And as you can see, Jesus' hand is in focus, but the rest of him is blurry. I learned from Ty Gibson, you may know him, he is, he's an awesome speaker, that Jesus teaches us the way up is down. Jesus' hand is clear because he is in our storm. He is in our situation. While we are sinking, he reaches down into our mess. This is hope incarnate. This is the Jesus, not just of Peter's story, but the Jesus of your story who decides, yeah, I see your storm. I'm going to walk on top of it. Not only that, I'm going to tell it to stop. Not only that, I'm going to reach down to you and pull you up so that you can walk with me. This is the Jesus that gives us infinite hope. Martin Luther says it so beautifully. He says, when I look at myself, I do not see how I can be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I can be lost. We have infinite hope because infinite hope is a person. Persecution is simply a byproduct of living that kingdom life that Jesus calls us to live. Remember, people are sitting in the dark. It's very shocking to turn on the light. My cat, I always think of him. Whenever I turn on the light, he's always squinting. It's very shocking to have the light turned on when you're sitting in the dark. So this is what's happening whenever we bring that kingdom life to those that maybe aren't ready for it. 
Eugene Peterson also paraphrases verses 11 through 12 here. He says, not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds and know that you are in good company. My prophets and my witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Oh, I love that. I love that. Let me end with one more quote from uh, Shane Claiborne. He says this, I think the invitation is to live with imagination. That prophetic imagination that says, I'm going to try to see the world with new eyes. I'm going to try to notice people that other people don't notice. I'm going to live in ways that don't compute with the patterns of the world because when you do that, you will become a holy troublemaker.